right, good evening everyone. Um, it's my honor <laughs> to introduce one of the very best, uh, in my humble opinion, I should say the best and definitely the most important filmmaker of our time, Christopher Nolan. <laughs> because the entire film is then structured in reverse chronology, so I included a, a backwards opening, uh, you know, where Guy Pierce shoots Joe Pantoliano in reverse, and, you know, begins with him catching the gun and, and that kind of thing. And it's sort of stuck with me that I'd be interested in exploring that reality, uh, the reality that the camera can show us that we can't see. Uh, with the first, you know, the, the movie generation, you know, this hundred years or so, were the first people uh, to ever be able to see time in different ways. It's the movie camera that's shown us time backwards. Um, it's one of the original kind of fascinating effects of what a movie camera can show us. And so I became interested in the idea quite some time ago, uh, really following on from Memento, rather than um, the structure of the story being backwards what if you could literally change the direction of time for a character or for an object and, and have two directions of time existing in the same frame. So not time travel, not jumping around in time, uh, but actually looking at the physical process of time, which is, I, I had dealt with um, a lot in Interstellar. Uh, and I spent a lot of time talking to Kip Thorne, the great physicist who uh, helped me with Tenet as well, because it, it was so much fun sitting around talking to him about the implications of, of real world physics. And so much of it is truly stranger than, than fiction when you're dealing with relativity, black holes, you know, those kind of things. And we'd explored that so much and enjoyed exploring that together in Interstellar. As I got into Tenet, I, you know, I called him and I started talking about this notion of if you can invert the, the entropy of an object or a person. Um, and some interesting things immediately came out of it, like the idea that uh, you wouldn't be able to breathe air because it wouldn't pass across the membranes in the same way. Uh, or, or, or eat a chicken, for instance. If what happens if you eat a chicken? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of what ifs that, that uh, the film is designed to explore. Yeah. But uh, it's this, this uh, so the idea of the, uh, the to uh, approach him from you and not give. Uh, it, it did. I'd always been fascinated by the notion that all the laws of physics are reversible. They're all symmetrical in time, in terms of time, and so there's no reason that the entire universe can't run backwards, except for one law, and that's entropy. And there's, um, I suppose you'd call it a conflict or a disagreement in, in amongst physicists as to whether that's cause or effect. You know, whether entropy is the sign of the arrow of time or whether it's the cause of it. For the purposes of our film, we view it as the cause of it. So we, we postulate, okay, what if there were a machine that could, you know flip that um, and then the idea to merge that with a, the, the a spy movie yeah came uh, spontaneously or you 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 leave that idea uh, is living this other idea of a uh, time travel with by itself for a while or, or I think for me it was always fused with at least a thriller scenario I mean coming from this idea of guy Pierce and memento shooting somebody backwards, you know, the kind of kinetics involved in action cinema, thriller. Um, so I think the spy genre was always really part of it for me because it's the genre that gives you access to all of these uh, wonderful kinetic action movie tropes. Uh, you know, the gunfight, the car chase, you know, armies fighting each other, these kind of things. And what I wanted to do was really explore the sort of experience of, of watching an action film, watching a, uh, a spy movie, um, and sort of build out from that and try and build this sort of big screen, very immersive experience, you know, based on that, to try and sort of take it to another level. And, and 
find a reason for an audience to, to watch a car chase again and watch it in a different way and try and sort of look down the other end of the telescope at a lot of these tropes that we all kind of know and love from action cinema. Yeah, and more specifically from James Bond, because I, I felt that uh, you were playing with the, the, the Bond is almost a genre in itself. And yeah. you have like some, uh, each of James Bond, you have like the exotic place, you have the Bond girl, you have like the, the, the villain with the, that are always like, and I, I felt that you were playing with those those codes and something, having fun and so, so uh, in a subversive, subversive way. Yeah, I've always been a huge fan of, of the Bond films, as anyone who's seen any of my movies would know, but especially this one, um, or Inception as well, I suppose. Um, I think there's also a lot of uh, the Le Carre approach to espionage, uh, you know, and I think partly that's because with a Bond film, we have James Bond at the center, and nobody worries too much about the reality of the spy world that they're in, but when you have an anonymous figure at the center, the, the protagonist, you know, John David Washington's character, um, I wanted to take on some of that uh, complexity, some of that sort of jargon-based, sort of more John Le Carre, more, a bit more sort of real-world spycraft uh, feeling about the character and the way he interacts. Did you, did you, did you I heard that uh, Spielberg created uh, uh, Indiana Jones in reaction that he, he was not allowed to direct a Bond movie? Uh, did you direct your own Bond movie during Tenet? <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think I think I did, yeah. And I think I really got to. Uh, Here we go. Yeah. Out there. <laughs> I, I got to have a lot of fun with it. Um, certainly with Inception. You know, look at the end of Inception with the the sort of ski chase and the big fortress in the snow. That was very much a sort of homage to On Our Majesty's Secret Service, which is my favorite of the Bonds. But they, um, but I think with this, yeah, I just went into that mythology fully because what I was sort of trying to do was create a stylized science fiction experience on top of that. And so you're trying to use the same way Memento tried to use the familiarity of the tropes of the film noir. You know, Tenet is an attempt to use the audience's familiarity with the spy movie genre, the Bond movie, um, to be able to take it someplace uh, a little crazier, someplace a little different, and, and have us experience it in a different way. There's something about uh, uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, spectacular uh, scenes. And, and Tenet, but one of them that really uh, absolutely uh, blew my mind was this uh, close combat between the protagonist and himself. And it's probably, it's an, I know I, I don't say that to, to uh, please you, but it's probably one of the most exciting uh, combat sequences on any film story. Seriously, it's, it's mind blowing what you, re you were able to achieve on camera. And, and, and I would love if you could explain to us a little bit how did you achieve uh, having uh, both uh, uh, actors uh, fighting in different time direction. <laughs> uh, it was not so much my achievement as my challenge to an incredible crew, George Cottle, stunt coordinator, Jackson Spadol, fight coordinator, and then John David Washington, who was in the NFL, was an incredible athlete, uh, and had such dedication to learning this very long fight from both sides. So he had two versions of the fight to learn, uh, protagonist and antagonist. And then he had to learn it backwards for both parts as well. And we shot it day one. You know, we started with it. Uh, and, you know, I, I just wanted, because I, I sort of felt like sometimes it's good to start with the hardest stuff because we knew there were so many mind-bending things to work out later in the film. I felt like of every department, you know, if stunts and wardrobe and uh, production design, if camera, you know, if everybody could come together and figure out how to do that, we'd be in better shape for when we got to the middle of town and shot the whole city down and did a massive car chase. You know, we, we really had to know what we were doing by then. And so it was this approach to shooting um, everything in camera. There are no, you know, visual effects in those fights. And it's all incredible performance and knowing the fight four different ways uh, and being able to switch with it. And then Hoyter shooting on IMAX handheld um, according to a rule set that I put in place that basically said we weren't ever going to reverse the footage. So we weren't ever going to use something from that we'd shot for the first fight sequence we see it for the second. Each piece of film is unique and so everything is changed slightly uh, in order to give you a, a different perspective on things. 
And so, I mean, the most obvious example for people who've seen the film more than once may have noticed is uh, the tint, you know, on the mask that John David's wearing. It's completely dark the first time you're seeing that antagonist. The second time you see it, it's a lighter tint so that you can see his eyes through it because we're seeing it from his perspective. So the camera's closer to him, we're seeing his expressions and, and doing that. Similarly with the sound, we're, we're using you know, his sound as foreground. So first as the suited protagonist uh, without the mask. And then the second time we see it, we're, we're favoring the sound of the guy behind the mask whose eyes we can now see a bit. But the camera angles are different and the axis is, is different. But it meant that one actor was doing the choreography backwards and the other one was doing, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's just like, a, yeah. I'm trying to explain it to myself. But I one of, one of, one of All night it, I thought about it last night. I mean, no. <laughs> There's one had to do it forward. So John David had to do it forwards. He then had to get changed, different costume, and do it backwards. Uh, and needed to know, uh, sorry, I misspoke. Was there was no wardrobe change. You do it backwards in the same wardrobe. Um, although we had a different tie, so it was stiffer, so it wouldn't move the same way, that kind of thing. Uh, and then he would have to go get changed into the SWAT outfit, do the entire fight forwards, then do the entire fight backwards in that wardrobe. And then we took everybody to Estonia, to Tallinn, and we shut down a freeway across the city, and we had to do that. The stunt guys had to do that with cars. They had to do it with driving. They literally do a chase forwards with regular vehicles, forwards and with vehicles that you drive backwards at speed, uh, and then the other way around. So everything was sort of shot four different ways. And uh, they did just an incredible job um, putting together all these rigs to be able to do that. It's, 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 it's remarkable. The, 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 I've seen the movie many times, and I love movies that are like enigmas. Movies that uh, the more you revisit them, you see new things every time, but you have to watch them a couple of times, and Tenet is definitely one of, the, uh, of those. And uh, I, had, uh, uh, I went uh, online to see uh, how people dealt with the, with the, with, and I, I seen it, a, a remarkable uh, uh, graphics where people were trying to explain, and it looks like a, a madman subway, you know, like where, where the uh, map, and it, it even then uh, when you look at it visually, uh, uh, it's it's uh, pretty impressive. It's still difficult to understand. My question is, as a filmmaker, when you make a regular movie with a very simple narrative, you still have sometimes some of your crew members that are confused. Were you the only one keeping the, the, the compass on set? Or, I, or you? <laughs> I, I, I've, done, I've done films where I'm, I'm in that role of, of the only person. I think with a lot of Inception, sometimes I was the person with a handle on it. With Tenet, what we found is I had a handle on it while I was writing the script, but when it comes to the execution and the detail, uh, I didn't have a handle on it any more than anyone else. We had to pre-visualize things. We had to look at computer graphics. We had to use tools to be able to look at the palindrome of each sequence, to look at it one way, look at it the other, and work on it from both ends together. So of, of any of the films I've done, it was the most collaborative effort you know we would all get in the room and there were no we, we said right from day one we learned this there are no stupid questions <laughs> because what we found is everybody's brain you would you'd get certain things right and you couldn't understand why other people couldn't get them and then you'd suddenly realize you were wrong you know and a lot of it was about diagrams and rules and, and all the rest so a huge amount of work went into pre-visualization and we changed things on the previous to make sure that the sequences all worked, you know, completely. Um, so it was a very, very collaborative effort. Uh, it was, it was never a. The, the basic concept behind Tenet, with the mixing of, of timelines within the frame, it was something that we realized as we shot. You were never able to intuit. It's something you have to experience. So, you could describe it even in the edit suite. You know, I was working with Jen Lane, um, and. You know, I would try and explain something to it, but ultimately you had to sort of put it together and then talk about it, look at it, and then look at it in different directions and talk about it. And that's what I kind of loved about the concept. It's purely a cinematic concept. You know, you, you have to sit in the movie theater and watch it and let it wash over you and sort of experience it. It's not something you can intellectualize. Yeah, I understand. The, 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 um, I would love, uh, uh, if you, you were talking a bit about IMAX earlier and, and uh, talk about uh, what is the percentage of uh, IMAX uh, in, in the movies? Uh, 
Gosh, I know, but I don't know. Yeah, no, no, it's been a, a few years old, <laughs> but but it, but it's a, it's there's let's say it's not the whole movie. No, and I, and I was wondering, uh, oh, what is your uh, decision for? Is it driven by sound? For or? me, a lot of the time it's driven by by sound um, because IMAX film cameras are very noisy. They're, they're huge and cumbersome and very noisy, and so you have to make decisions about whether you want to post synchronize the sound or whether you want to be able to record and use the real performances. Which so the film is a mix of 65 millimeter FIFA, which you can, you know, Panavision has a quiet camera for that, uh, and that's the letterbox format, and then it expands to the 15 per 70 mil, usually for the action sequences. And what we found over the years is there are different cut points you can mix. You know, you can put that cut point in a different place to either make the screen feel like it's suddenly expanding, um, or you can disguise the cuts. I mean, in the final sequence when the protagonist is in the back of the car, all the shots inside the car are letterboxed and the ones outside aren't. And it plays because of the low ceiling and the dark ceiling of the car. Um, so it's something that from, we first started to play with uh, In the Dark Knight. Yeah, um, absolutely. We've been messing around with it ever since in different ways. Yeah, because it, is, uh, it creates almost, it's a new way to install the, uh, uh, in the, use a new way of a, a new editing tool in some ways yeah. to create impact and yeah. uh, as you uh, rightly said uh, 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 to tell you the truth i remember studying uh, the dark knight and, and, and interstellar <laughs> the first time I, uh, for uh, part one when, when when i had to for the first time shoot in 143 to, uh, trying to uh, make my own decisions about I, uh, when you say part one part one of doom ah doom. <laughs> <laughs> which reminds me so the five minute piece you saw at the front, uh, which is from Dune 2, I just want to turn the tables because we're running out of time and ask you a few questions about Dune 2. But I was fine at talking about I know. Dune 2. I know. <laughs> There's not much that you could say about it at this point. But I've seen it, so I can say. So <laughs> uh, being respectful of spoilers, but uh, watching the piece uh, in this format, I was frankly just thrilled how amazing the translation is to this format for the film. I think it's an incredibly exciting way for, for people to see it. And what I was really struck by was the sense of immersion in that world. There's a little bit of, we talked about a little bit of grit to it. There's a little bit of you know, the emotion of, of that. You, you feel, you know, watching that, that scene where, um, you know, Tim is, is reunited uh, and reveals himself. It, it's, it's thrilling and very emotional as it is in the, the finished film. Um, I just wanted to ask you, looking at the minds, the detail of that world and how it works, where does, where has that all come from? Because without saying too much about the finished film, it's a film that has so many unique images, so many things you've never seen before in this movie, time after time, that I was so struck by the detail of everything, those minds coming out of the sand and things like that. And they're not all from the book. I mean, where, where is that coming from with your team? How are you putting those details together? Uh, frankly, it's like a, a thing that I spent a lot of time in the screenplay. Uh, 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 I wrote with John Spade, but I spent a lot of time myself alone. And, and, I, and I, uh, through the years, there's ideas that I, I, I accumulated that I wanted to insert in, the, in this film. And in this, uh, it's really, uh, it was all inspired by Frank Herbert, the book, but uh, it's true that I had to come up with uh, ideas to bring the words in a more cinematic way. And, and it's just like uh, uh, a lot of uh, things are coming out of the storyboard process as well, where I have to translate the scene to find the most economic and, and the most expressive, expressive way to, to, to bring ideas to the screen. And, and it's really- Do you draw your own storyboards or- unfortunately, unfortunately, no, Chris. <laughs> I, I, I'm a very bad at drawing, but I was raised <laughs> When I was young, uh, uh, I didn't have access to any camera, and I was doing, uh, uh, I was dreaming uh, about filmmaking. And the way I was dreaming, I was my, with my best friend, who was, a, who is still today a fantastic uh, uh, drawer, and we had like a very close connection. And I, 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 I was writing, he was drawing, and I learned very early on to communicate and 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 I have that very strong connection. And I found a storyboard artist that made all mostly all of my films so far where it's almost like an extension of my brain where I can, uh, 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 in a very intimate moment, dream, alone. I will say alone, I'm not alone, I'm with someone 
else, but, uh, but uh, 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 that's where a lot of ideas are coming from, visual ideas are coming from. Are, are you a good writer? You... No, not particularly. And I, <laughs> I don't actually storyboard that much. I've done certain sequences, and I don't particularly use previs, but on Tenet, we use massive amounts of previs for, to be able to look at the timeline back and forth. Um, but I think, I mean, it's fascinating to hear that you, so you creatively, you started with storyboarding before you ever got a camera. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is that I feel still today, once the, the, the screenplay is done, I will storyboard most the, of the movie, or if not the entire movie, and it's a new way to rewrite and to approach, bring the words closer to the, to the camera, and I then, once the storyboard I finish, I rewrite the screenplay again, again from the storyboards, because there's a lot of changes that will be found through the storyboards, uh, and uh, it's a way also to, for me, to find the alphabet and the vocabulary that would be used, the cinematic uh, alphabet of the film, the rhythm, everything is in the boards. And is that before you have the whole team on? Or absolutely, absolutely. Right. I do it by myself. And it's a way to dream about the movie in the most intimate way. It's one of my favorite moments of the film process. Yeah. Now, I, there's a, a rule on, on my set is that uh, uh, the, the storyboard precedes the, the, the screenplay, and nature precedes the storyboard. So, which means that most of the time I throw the storyboard out and we, we <laughs> improvise with the camera. But, uh, but it, it, it secures me to find the movie with the boards. I think it's almost a, a, a different way to write to go deeper into the screenwriting process more specifically for the cinematic sequences yeah yeah so what do you feel comfortable telling this audience about the new film what are you what are you comfortable <laughs> revealing in this in this environment if anything well, but uh, listen uh, 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 first of all it's like a, a movie that i've tried to uh, create that, that to be a standalone meaning that it's like a direct continuity of, of part one but i wanted the movie to be able someone who have, will have not seen uh, part one will be able to to enjoy part two uh, i gave enough clues in it uh, to, <laughs> to make sure that uh, uh, someone uh, uh, you don't need to have seen part one i will say that uh, uh, i feel it's a much more i don't know if you agree with other more muscular movie it's a movie that uh, oh, yeah. has more action sequence and uh, as a filmmaker it's much more uh, uh, much more challenging but definitely more i had uh, much more fun doing it because it's like uh, we go uh, it's a, a guerrilla warfare movie where we follow paul and shani starting to do guerrillas again the arcanans and uh, um, I will say for the, the fans of the book, the people who know the book, that the movie is uh, slightly different. I can say that. Uh, there's something that's some more, uh, the, film, the movie I feel it could be seen as more tragic than the book. Um, when Frank Herbert wrote the, original, the, the first book, he was a bit disappointed how people perceived uh, the book uh, because for him, Paul was not a hero. He was a, a dark figure. He was someone that it was, for him, it was like the book, book was a cautionary tale about the, uh, uh, messianic figures. And uh, uh, to correct uh, uh, the perception, he wrote to Messiah to make sure that people would understand that uh, that uh, Paul uh, turned uh, uh, to, uh, let's say, the dark side for uh, those who would like a better way of it. But, um, and me, I had the benefit of time like your uh, protagonist in Tenet had the information in the, from the future. <laughs> I knew uh, what was the, the intentions of Herbert. So I try at my best to do this as adaptation closer to the initial intention of Frank Herbert. Well, and I, don't, I won't uh, necessarily ask you your exact point of reference, but for me, I don't think it's safe too much to say that you know, if Dune Part 1 was Star Wars, this to me was very much The Empire Strikes Back, which is my favorite of the Star Wars films. And, I just think it's an incredibly exciting expansion of all the things you introduced in the first one. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to say to you, Chris, that this is a massive compliment because <laughs> I, I, I'm still uh, trim, uh, uh, the Empire Strikes Back was probably one of the most intense uh, 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 screening experience of my life. I, I, I was like uh, 11 years old or something like that, and I, I, I uh, at the time you were going watching movies and you could. Uh, uh, watch the movies back to back. <laughs> the, the theater yeah, owner yeah. were we were going to making 25 kilometers and bicycles to see the movie, so the theater owner was like, let us all the afternoon watching the movie over and over again. <laughs> and and, and uh, it's a movie that has had a tremendous impact on me. 
and uh, uh, it's again uh, to this day by far uh, the, the best uh, Star Wars movie for me and, and uh, I'm pleased to know that you loved uh, Empire Strikes Back as well. <laughs> I, I, I do indeed and I think that your, your sequel reminded me of it in all the right ways whilst being completely different from it. So uh, I think it's an extraordinary piece of work and I think people are going to be amazingly uh, excited to see it and they'll be able to see it on IMAX film. So our tenant re-releases the 23rd and then June 2 will be on the same screen, also 70 mil film print. Um, and it's a wonderful translation. I think it, uh, the format looks looks incredible there. So I need to say that I was able to bring Dune part two. I shot it for IMAX, but I was do, able to do a translation to, 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 we were able to do pinprints because of you, because of the success of Oppenheimer. And that I'm so grateful again, Chris Nolan, I cannot say thank you enough for what you do, are doing all this thank you. Thank you. Um, Yeah, and on that note, I know it's it's late, so we should we should wrap it up. But I, I actually just wanted to very quickly uh, acknowledge uh, someone who's in the the credits of uh, Tenet, uh, who worked at Warner Brothers for many years, called Scott Null, who was one of the best projectionists at, at Warner's, uh, who passed away. Uh, just last week, and it may be, it just makes me feel better to say his name to people uh, and acknowledge uh, all the great work he did for me over the years, but also keeping film alive, having these kind of screenings, what we're going to get to do with Tenet, what we did with Oppenheimer this summer, and what you're going to get to do too, what you're going to get to do, uh, totally dependent on the guys in the booth, uh, these incredible projectionists who work so hard for us. So, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge them and, and thank them for everything they've done for us. Um, and I want to thank you, Denis, for, for being here this evening. Thanks, Tony. Thank a little bit about you. Thank you. Thank you.